Okay, so conventional medicine involves biomedically based medicine is practiced by holders of the uh, medical doctor, the MD, and the DO, the doctor of osteopathy. Uh, I used to work for a DO. He's the best doctor I've ever, I've ever worked for. I ever worked for as a DO. Uh, they have degrees uh, and they're allied health professionals. These are the individuals who are considered allied health professionals. Uh, Evidence-based medicine removes the collection, uh, interpretation, and, and, and integration of the best research-based evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And as I said, don't get upset. I'm not talking about. I'm not. I'm not talking about uh, Navajo medicine, even though there's a picture of a Navajo medicine man. Holistic medicine considers not only physical health, but also the emotional, spiritual, and social psychological well-being of the patient. Complementary and alternative medicine, medicine or CAMS, uh, involve use and practice of therapies of diagnostic techniques that fall outside conventional biomedicine. I used to, my next door neighbor used to be uh, Don Robinson, who has a PhD from a Transcendental Meditation University, so, and a master's degree from a Transcendental Meditation University. You can imagine the conversations we had. Anyway, <laughs> so he went to a CAM University, was interested in this, in Iowa. Uh, so, there you go. Uh, Complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, whole medical systems are, are healthcare systems that evolved independently of Western biomedicine. Uh, it includes traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, and homeopathy. Uh, Ayurveda, of course, is from India. China, Chinese medicine comes from China. How many Chinese people are there? 1.5 billion. How many, how many um, uh, people live in India? 1.3 billion. Uh, so when we're talking about Ayurveda and Chinese medicine, we're talking about a lot of people. Uh, my wife was stationed in Korea, and they had to hire Korean doctors because uh, uh, not only were they taking care, care of American medical or uh, military personnel, but they were also taking care of their wives, and some of their wives were, were Korean. Uh, so in order for them to hire a Korean doctor, uh, they, for a doctor to get a, a degree in, in uh, Korea, a medical degree in Korea, uh, they have to not only have an MD from uh, the Western style of medicine, but they also have to, have to uh, take Chinese medicine. They can take them 10 years to get a medical degree in Korea. Uh, so they have to know acupuncture as well. It was really kind of interesting. They struggled trying to find somebody. And then when they found them, they had to pay them twice as much as they paid anybody else because they literally had two medical degrees. Mind and body medicine include meditation, yoga, acupuncture, deep breathing exercises, guided imagery, hypnosis, progressive relaxation, uh, Kai Gong and Tai Chi. Uh, you probably know Tai Chi as the exercise where they move very slowly in, in a very uh, rhythmic manner uh, and they, they move their arms and, and bodies uh, in a specific way. Uh, natural products include botanicals, vitamins, minerals, and other natural products. Uh, manipulative and body-based uh, practices include spinal manipulation and massage therapy. Uh, other uh, Complementary and uh, alternative medicines um, include uh, movement therapies, traditional healers, manipulation of various energy fields, and putative energy fields. Uh, I told you, I think I told you last time I've got a friend that lives, whose parents live in Sonora, Sedona, Sedona, where all the crystals are. <laughs> uh, fascinating people. <laughs> They're both tall and skinny. And so they've got all kinds of interesting back problems because the vertebrates are so long or something. I don't know. Anyway, this guy's like 20 years younger than me and he can barely walk. But he's got crystals. And he puts those crystals on his back and by God they work. I wonder how that happens. This is important stuff. Anyway. He, he says he can feel the energy field. He walks around Sedona and he can feel the energy coming up through the ground.
Money? Oh, man. I got Uh, it's a pay-to-play situation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, to provide health treatment uh, that is natural, holistic, and promote uh, wellness, this is the ideal of the uh, uh, complementary and alternative medicines. Uh, back to nature backlash against modern technology, science, and biomedicine. Of course, this is another portion. This is another ideal of the CAMS. Uh, uh, over specialization and fragmentation of modern medicine. Uh, biomedicine may fight illness, but generally does not focus on producing an optimal state of vitality. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any idea what this thing says, what the blanket says? W A S H. Washington. Well, Washington, yeah, but that's, that's a guy. He's, a, it's, he's an Navajo hero. Um, why would he have a blanket from Washington? Probably the person that's named in. Oh, that's a lady from Washington. From Washington State. I don't know. Anyway. Integrating medicine is a multidisciplinary approach to medicine that involves traditional biomedical interventions as well as complementary and alternative medical practices that have been proven both safe and effective. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I may seem so reticent about uh, teaching this stuff is because, well, I, I, I uh, worked in medicine for a number of years. Of course, I haven't been in medicine for 20 years, uh, but I worked in medicine for 30 years, and so that may be one of the reasons why I'm so <clears throat> reticent about talking about these kinds of things. Uh, I've seen all kinds of interesting things. Uh, my wife uh, has had back problems, which turned out to be a to, turned out to be hip problems, uh, but of course nobody diagnosed her correctly. Uh, massage therapists, chiropractors, uh, who else? Acupuncturists, they all missed the boat. Everybody missed the boat. But then again, medicine also missed the boat. I'm not sure how. Yes, I am. I am exactly sure how. This is what happened. About uh, 18 months ago, they took uh, x-rays of my wife's hips. Uh, and at that point, there, there, it wasn't too, too degenerated. Uh, but because of insurance and because the federal government, we know how the federal government is. Sometimes they'll pay for things and sometimes they won't. Uh, they didn't want to pay for another set of uh, x-rays until uh, for 18 months. And finally, of course, <laughs> we would have paid for it. I mean, it's not that expensive. X-rays, what, two, three hundred bucks? That's not so bad. Uh, but I mean, we would have done it, but uh, they, we didn't really have the opportunity. And uh, the insurance wouldn't pay for it, so the doctor would order it. And uh, her hips have degenerated that much, and now, now she can barely walk. And like I, I keep telling people, I think she's going to have to have uh, her hips uh, replaced over the, over the summer. So if you come to class, well, not the two of you guys are leaving. <laughs> if you come to class and I'm not here, there's, uh, you know, in, in August, you'll know where I am. I'm trying to take care of my wife. Uh, anyway, I, I need to tell the administration that don't I? Yeah, probably. Okay. Uh, I, I anticipate there won't be any problems. She's a uh, fairly uh, healthy young, young woman. I say young, she's 66. Uh, but, you know, there's, you never know what's going to happen. I mean, she could throw a plot. There could be all kinds of interesting things happen. Uh, in which case, uh, I will not be able to uh, come back right away. Uh, first surgery is uh, the 23rd of May, and the second surgery is sometime in June. So, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> I don't, like I said, I don't anticipate anything negative happening. Uh, she's a fairly positive person. We'll see what happens. Uh, so what's happening here? Vitalism is a concept of general life force popular uh, in some varieties of uh, uh, CAMs. Uh, traditional Chinese medicine is an ancient integrated herb and acupuncture-based system of healing founded on the principle that internal harmony is essential for good health. Internal harmony, which is really kind of interesting because harmony is very important in uh, the Navajo culture as well. Uh, not, well, yeah, even at internal harmony as, as well as external harmony. 
A uh, recent survey conducted by the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Me Medicine, an estimated 38% of Americans use some form of uh, CAM, a CAM. Uh, CAM is used primarily for back problems, anxiety, depression, and headaches. Most users say they believe that combining alternative and traditional medicine will produce faster results, and that's one of the reasons why they use CAMs uh, as a supplement to, uh, to regular medicine. In 2008, more than 37,000 of responding hospitals indicated offering one or more alternative medicine therapies, and that's up from 26.5% in 2005. Uh, so there are more people, there are more hospitals around the United States using it. Uh, most people around here use CAMs as well. They use, uh, well, I don't know, I'm, like I said, I don't like to call it. Navajo medicine uh, cams, but uh, uh, they use Navajo medicine as well as, as regular medicine. I was talking to a lady downstairs, her son has a thyroid problem, and, and uh, she said that she's, she needs to give him a ceremony so he can, so everything will, will be back to normal. Uh, really kind of an interesting idea. <clears throat> I told her you need to give that kid that medicine. It's thyroid medicine. You can't function well with your thyroid. I mean, that's your metabolism. So I told her, don't, don't not give him his medicine just to save money. Crazy lady. I to call her crazy lady. I was thinking crazy lady. Many of the same trends that led to the emergence of health psychology led to increasing interest in CAMs. Um, normal medicine is costly. Uh, it's very impersonal. Uh, the adverse effects of treatment uh, very frequently, especially cancers. Uh, radiation therapy, uh, chemotherapy, uh, the profit-driven nature of healthcare, and it, and it seems to be getting worse. Uh, once upon a time, we, could, we thought that all doctors were greedy bastards, um, and, I, and I do mean the word bastard, uh, that uh, they were just in, in, in medicine for the money, uh, then, and so we decided that we'd take medicine away from the, the uh, doctors. We gave it to the insurance company. Insurance companies are really nice people. They don't want money. They're not trying, they're not there for a profit. They're there to help people, right? No, they're there for a profit. So all of a sudden we had these HMOs and PPOs. Uh, and what was going on was, was that they would not allow people to have uh, surgery. They wouldn't allow them to have any, any medical treatment, which was just Horrible. It was just horrible because the doctors were screaming. Uh, it was a uh, it was a um, uh, conservative move in the United States to uh, to give medicine to the uh, insurance companies. Uh, so the uh, one one group of individuals, all of them, one group of individuals were really happy about it. But some people made money like in, by the bucket full. And they raised medical costs. That was the part that irritated everybody. It didn't lower medical costs. It raised medical costs. So then they came up with this idea of the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, or what people do call uh, Obamacare. And it set a limit on, on how much you could charge for things. Uh, doctors weren't very happy about it. Uh, the HMOs were really pissed off about it because they weren't making the profits that they were making before. Uh, but now it's, it looks like they're going to try. They're trying to dismantle it. Uh, it's been the only um, uh, cost uh, structure that we've had for an extended length of time. Uh, Medicare and uh, and uh, Medicaid costs. So uh, one of the problems we have, of course, is that uh, medical care is, is profit driven, uh, and we still do have doctors who are are greedy. They're they're just greedy. I knew a doctor that uh, would, uh, if he needed something, uh, he would do surgery on somebody. Next guy that comes in the door is going to have their appendix taken out. It was one of those kind of deals. And he was just a... And he wasn't a bad doctor. I mean, he was a good doctor, but if he needed money, he would do something that he would need to do. Uh, and he never got caught. <clears throat> A more activist, uh, consumer-oriented view of the patient role, of course, is what uh, the CAMs are. So what about the guys, that, the chiropractors? What about all these guys? The massage therapists, the aromatherapists, what about all these people? Are they after money? Are they in it to help people? 
Is anybody in it to help people? Uh, it's the question, I guess. Just let us all die, I guess. Uh, one of the things about being in the military was you didn't have to worry about whether the doctors were, were, were doing something to you just for the money because they, were, they made whatever money they made. And that's all the money they made. They could have worked really, really hard and still made the same amount of money, or they could have, worked, they could have done nothing, which a lot of them did, and they could have made exactly the same money they were making anyway. So that was kind of fun, being in the military. You didn't have to worry about money. So I got out and started working in medicine, and gee, many Christmas. Uh, they, I mean, while, when I was in the military, I did whatever I needed to be done, but, you know, to help patients. When I was out working in the civilian community, they wanted me to do a select amount of work and charge for that work so that they could make more profit. And I'm scratching my head a lot, trying to think I did whatever I needed to do anyway. <clears throat> I don't care about money. My wife does. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's got to pay all the bills. <laughs> Differences in perspective and focus. Biomedical researchers demand evidence from controlled clinical trials. CAM practitioners often claim that treatment variables cannot be studied independently, and this is kind of a problem. So how frequently is this working? If you were talking about the ceremonies on the reservation, does it work every time? It doesn't. Give me a percentage, I don't know. 90% of the time? 75%? 75%? 50%? We don't have any critical evidence to back that. But that's okay, that's all right. <clears throat> any, you'll do anything to, to, be, to be healed. When you're in pain, you'll do anything to be healed. You really will. So, and that's okay. It's just the way it worked. Uh, my sister was dying of cancer. I think I told you this. Uh, so she had a sweat up in up in Montana. We had a sweat for her, and we tied the, the uh, material on the tree and, and in the right direction, facing the right direction, which was a little confusing. She died anyway. I don't know if that means anything. But she tried. She also tried other things. She went to. England and she walked up the spiral mound. There's a spiral mound that, uh, that is supposed to heal you if you walk in a certain direction. You walk up one way and then you walk down the other way. You have to walk up counterclockwise and you have to walk down clockwise, which is, I don't know, <clears throat> didn't work, that didn't work either. Uh, many CAM practitioners endorse interventions, uh, even uh, when the evidence backing their claims is far from convincing, based on conventional standards of science. So when we're talking about science, this doesn't really fit. CAMs really don't fit, because we really can't uh, do any empirical studies on, uh, on, on any of the uh, things that they're talking about. CAM <coughs> evidence is often based on inform informal case studies. Anecdotal evidence is research evidence based on informal case histories. I'm sure uh, Sarah talks about uh, anecdotal evidence all the time. Uh, I'm, sure that, I'm sure that Christine talks about anecdotal evidence all the time. Uh, in which there is little or no objective documentation regarding a patient's diagnosis or effectiveness of a treatment. Many CAM studies also rely on self-report and single outcome measures. So we're looking at a person and this person was healed. Okay, is that, does that mean that this, this works? If I'm doing acupuncture on somebody and I do acupuncture on a select individual and they are actually healed, there are people that swear by acupuncture. Is that, is that good enough? Should I go and get acupuncture for my plantar fasciitis? And it's not so bad today, I've got basketball shoes on. Is that good enough? Yes, no. Or is it anecdotal? Work on me. If we talk about opiates and somebody says, oh, well, Brad, well, I gave him a shot of morphine and didn't take the pain away, I guess morphine doesn't work. Is that, would that make any sense? Or am I anecdotal? Or am I alien? I guess I'm sure. <laughs> 
Most people, you give them a shot of morphine, knocks them right out. Me, it doesn't even touch me. Anyway, yeah, so, so anecdotal evidence is really kind of a problem that we have. Uh, possible causes of improvement in the condition, treatment is effective, if the treatment might actually work. Uh, the patient, patient may have been mis misdiagnosed to begin with, and of course that's what's going on with my wife. She's misdiagnosed over and over and over and over and over again. And finally, they took the, the set of x-rays after 18 months, of course. And now they know that she has degenerative hip disease and she has to have her hips replaced. The illness improved on, her, on its own over time, and things do happen, <coughs> don't they? Sometimes things will heal without, uh, without any treatment at all. Remember that the human body wants to be healed. The human brain wants to be healed. We want to be normal. We want to be able to go out and do things. I want to go, be able to go out and run without any pain in my head. It's not happening right now, but eventually it's going to go away. It'll go away. Whether I treat it or not, it'll go away. Cancer will probably not go away. Well, maybe it will. If you've got a cancer, sometimes your body will arrest that cancer. It will stop it. It will make it benign. A malignant tumor will be encapsulated by your immune system, and it will become benign. That happens. Hmm. Okay. So sometimes the patient's misdiagnosed. <laughs> oh, I don't even talk about some of my stories about misdiagnosing patients. Didn't have anything to do with me. Usually had to do with me. Ah. Oh. So, <laughs> so, so that's so one time this lady came in, we drew her blood, and we ran a, a sodium acid on her. Uh, we ran a sodium and potassium on her, and sodiums are always the same, and potassiums are always the same. Uh, the sodium, her sodium, a normal sodium is like 140, 140 milli equivalents per liter, uh, and normal potassium is 4, 144. Okay. So she comes in, and we run, and, and everybody has exactly, you know, everybody's got the right amount of salt in their body, right? Salt, salt, and uh, so, And everybody's got the same. Somewhere between 135 and 145. Everybody. We never see anybody with an with a abnormal sodium. This lady came in, she came in with a 117. The doctor went ballistic. We just killed that lady. I know, the lab killed the lady. Well, she's still alive. I mean, she's not dead yet. But according to him, you can't live with 117 uh, sodium. You need more salt in your system. She would be, if she had a 117, my goodness, she wouldn't, wouldn't be able to walk around. And here she is, she's perfectly normal. So we tore down the machine. We, he was sure that there was a problem. He said, maybe you contaminated her specimen. She came back in, we drew her blood again, we ran it again, and we got a 150. And the doctor screaming at us. He's, okay, we break the machine down. He's, He's threatening to send us all to Vietnam. This is, really, this is in the early 70s. <laughs> he's going to send all of us to Vietnam. <laughs> uh, he's, and unfortunately, not only was he the, uh, the in, in, uh, internist, but he was also our the lab rep. So he really could have sent us all to Vietnam. So she comes in again. After, I don't know, two or three days, she came, comes in again. We draw her blood. We run, run it. It's on the blood. We broke the machine down, we cleaned the whole thing out. Uh, she started out with a 117, she went to a 115, now she's at a 111. The doctor is so pissed. He is so pissed. So he decides that he'll talk to her this time. He hasn't, he's just been looking at her and not, not even actually talking to her. So she comes in and uh, he, he talks to her and he asks, has anything different uh, happened? Uh, we can't get a good result for you on, uh, from the laboratory. Evidently, those idiots down there at the laboratory don't know what they're doing. And she says, yeah, I started a new diet. Well, what kind of a diet did you start? Well, she's drinking, it's a water diet. She's drinking have, uh, large doses of water. So instead of eating, she's filling her stomach up with water. So she's not taking in any other food, so well, she's taking the same food. For not very many, and she is she's hyperhydrating herself. Well, you can kill yourself that way, and she actually almost has. 
Uh, but that's what it was. It was the fact that she was diluting her blood out so much that her, her sodium had gone down to 100. And her potassium was like 3.1 or something. So she should have been dead last night. Anyway, and he told her not to do that anymore. Uh, so the question is, did the doctor come down and apologize for t telling us all how stupid he was? And the answer is, well, just guess. Did he come down and apologize? Uh, no, no. <laughs> anyway, okay, so sometimes the patient is misdiagnosed. He was ready to, 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 show, to uh, start throwing dirt on that lady's face. Uh, and of course, she had she was just on her diet. She was doing something stupid, but she was losing weight. She was really happy about that. Uh, the illness improved on its own, of course, and this kind of happens from time to time. Uh, arthritis is cyclical. If you know anything about arthritis, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Um, sometimes you have spontaneous remission. Uh, we used to see this all the time in leukemia. Leukemia usually is, uh, used to be deadly because we had no treatment for it, but sometimes it just stops. The body kicks in, something happens, and it just goes into remission. We've seen that with, uh, with leukemia. We've also seen that with diabetes. Sometimes somebody will have type 2 diabetes, and then all of a sudden they don't. Well, what's this all about? Maybe they prayed to the right God. No, that's not good. <laughs> it just goes into remission. Uh, the placebo effect, uh, there are two types. The placebo effect has to do with uh, just thinking that something is going to work makes you feel better. And that's the placebo effect. Um, can you think of anything that would cause the placebo effect? I've got this magic pill, I'm going to give it to you, and I give it to you, and, and everything starts being better. You start feeling better. You take an aspirin, you take an ibuprofen, you take a, an acetaminophen. And, and your, whatever your, whatever ails you goes away almost immediately. That's impossible. It hasn't even dissolved in your stomach yet. How in the world could this possibly be happening? You're depressed, so they give you Prozac, and you take a pill, and you feel so much better. Well, that's impossible. It takes six weeks to get all that uh, all that serotonin into your into your system. So why do you feel so much better? Why does the pain go away? How can it possibly go away? I'm sorry? Bleeding does. Bleeding does, sure. But what does that do inside your body? There's actually a physical reaction that takes place. That's the placebo effect, but what is it? What's this magic substance that's making you feel so good? It's endorphins and keflins and dynorphins. We have these natural painkillers in our bodies. So there you go. And that, that's the way it works. And that's the placebo effect. Uh, there's also a nocebo effect, which is something that I learned when I read this book. The nocebo effect is a phenomenon in which inert substances or mere suggestions of a substance actually brings about negative effects on, in a patient or research participant. So we give you a drug, and you suddenly start having the opposite effect that it's supposed to have. And this is known as the nocebo effect. And some people are, up north they call contraires. Uh, these are individuals who uh, do the, uh, are, they have, always have the opposite reaction to whatever they're supposed to have. I'm not a contraire. I, I swear I'm not. Just because opium doesn't work on me. Opiates don't work on me. doesn't make me a contraire. But these individuals, every time they give you, if they give you a pill to, uh, uh, to make you sleep, you get insomnia, as confusing as that may be. Uh, a good example of a nocebo is a concept, concept of voodoo, where belief can hurt you instead of help you, as in a placebo. Uh, any of the uh, ideas of evil spirits that people believe, and then allow these ideas to come true would be a nocebo. And of course, I don't know if you know anything about voodoo, but they stick pins into dolls, and then you, of course you start having symptoms, as strange as that may seem. Many alternative explanations, uh, decreased anxiety, of course, uh, may uh, work, and that's why the placebos work. Through classical conditioning, of course, um, remember, remembered wellness, uh, you start thinking about uh, what it's like, so you start imaging the, the wellness, and because you are imaging it, uh, the, uh, whatever your problem is goes away. 
Uh, I was lifting weights yesterday, <clears throat> and I started to throw up. Now, there's nothing more nasty than somebody in the gym vomiting all over the place. <laughs> uh, so I stopped myself, and I started thinking about not throwing up. And I, I didn't. I, I wasn't nauseous the rest of the time. I don't have any idea. I, well, I did that. I guess it was the toasted cheese sandwich I had for, lunch, for breakfast. <clears throat> anyway, I stopped myself. And it went away. I was able to make it go away just by imaging uh, not being sick. Placebos may tap a natural inner pharmacy of self-healing substances. And we do have an inner pharmacy. We can heal ourselves. We can make ourselves feel better. Any medical procedure can have a placebo effect. Critics contend that CAM's, uh, CAM is entirely uh, placebo-based, and I'm not going to argue that. Uh, <clears throat> some people say it's just all placebo effect. But then again, most medicine is placebo effect. I've known doctors who couldn't cure anybody, and it's mainly because they were such jerks. And I've known other doctors that everybody loved, and every time they treated somebody, they got better. And even if they didn't get better, they didn't want to tell the doctor because they didn't want to hurt his feelings because he's such a nice guy. Hmm. So, in order to, to be functional in medicine, you need to uh, be a nice guy. Acupuncture, uh, originally practiced only in China, has become increasingly popular throughout Western industrialized nations. It has proved uh, most successful in treating pain, Although practitioners contend that it rejuvenates the body. My God, I've got a full house here. What's happening? What did I do? I must have remembered my deodorant this time. <laughs> I don't know. Sticking pins in somebody doesn't seem to. But it, people say it works. Look at all the pins in this lady's face. Ouch. Or not. Evidently no. An acupuncture session uh, typically involves inserting thin acupuncture needles superficially or as deep as one or more inches. <laughs> Depending on the particular site and the practitioner's style of treatment. Uh, you guys know that Sarah is, hates needles. Okay, don't, don't even, okay. I, I keep forgetting. Of course, I was worked in medicine. I, I don't try to torture her. That would be, that would be cruel. But uh, sometimes I forget. I think I, I used the word gonorrhea the other day in front of her, and she just about uh, gave birth to a cow right there on the spot. <sighs> I keep forgetting. I'm not sure what she can tolerate and what she can't. Some days, some days, days are better than her. <laughs> anyway, I don't think she'd show you this picture. She'd probably start vomiting. Uh, that's, th these are our uh, acupuncture needles. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so what are we doing? We're treating ac acupuncture. Uh, which of the, which of the uh, approximately 2,000 acupuncture points are selected along with the angle and the depth of the needle insertion varies with the symptoms, so it all depends on what it is that you have. Uh, needles are sometimes twirled. Uh, I've only seen them twirled. I've never seen them heated or electri electrically stimulated uh, to maximize the, uh, their effect. I've seen them twist them, which seems kind of cruel to me. When I'm drawing blood from somebody, I certainly don't turn, turn the needle around. <laughs> Acupuncturists often also incorporate herbal medicine and dietary recommendations in their treatment regimen. Uh, one of the things that th this always drives me crazy. One of the things they'll ask you is, uh, when was your last bowel, bowel movement? Well, how was your last bowel movement? Which is kind of an odd thing. Uh, if you have those toxins in your system, maybe the acupuncture won't work properly. I don't know. I don't understand these things. Acupuncture is the uh, most heavily researched uh, CAM technique. Uh, thousands of studies have been published by acupuncturists. Of course, you can't argue with 1.5 billion people in China. Or can you? I mean, if it works on them, shouldn't it work on us? Us being people in the, not in China, I guess. I mean, if it works for those guys, why can't it work for us? Right? 
we were just talking about ceremonies. I mean, if it works for you guys, why can't I use a ceremony to get rid of something? I guess you have to believe first. And then again, I guess you have to believe in acupuncture for acupuncture, right? Oh, man, I don't believe in anything. There's something wrong with me. <clears throat> Thousands of studies have been published by acupuncturists, though most were uh, uncontrolled. Uh, pre post treatment using sample sizes that were too small, double blind uh, controls problematic. There's a lack of standardization of acupuncture sites, and this is a problem. Uh, they were, <laughs> remember, there are what, 250 languages, Chinese languages, uh, and each one uh, they do things differently. Uh, if we were talking about American, uh, American Indian uh, healing, uh, we'd be talking about five, 567 different tribes, right? And all of them are different, and you guys do the things the way you do it, the Hopi do it the way they do it, the Apache do it the way they do it, and of course, never the twain shall meet. And it's exactly the same way uh, with, the, with the acupuncture. There are a, a lot of... Uh, <laughs> uh, I was looking at... Uh, I was looking for a picture, and I found this picture uh, on the internet, and I was looking at another picture, and their sites are totally different. Uh, one was Korean and the other was Chinese. Theoretically, they're the same thing, but uh, some of the puncture sites were, were completely different, as confusing as that is. They were showing puncture sites in the hand for something or other. And the right hand is different than the left hand? I don't know. All these things confuse me greatly. There's a lack of standardization. Uh, sham acupuncture often works probably due to counter irritation or the placebo effect. So all you need to do is stick a pin in somebody and it makes them feel better. Have you ever heard of massage therapy? Uh, wait a minute, what is that? Uh, where they rub your feet and they can, they can, they can fix your headache with it. Yeah, re reflexology. I bought one of those books once upon a time. Uh, I was going to use it on my wife. <laughs> I won't tell you why. <laughs> oh, sometimes I'm just mean. Well, not mean. And sometimes I'm just nasty. Okay. <laughs> it didn't work. It certainly didn't work. None of my lines work on my wife. I mean, none of them. She's she's been listening to my lines for forty, almost forty years. Poor thing. I kind of feel sorry for her. Uh, but now I'm her nurse, so we'll see what happens this summer. More than 100 randomized controlled clinical trials have been conducted with acupuncture and several meta-analyses. Uh, the bottom line seems to be that there is mixed results that ac acupuncture provides some patients with some relief from osteoarthritis, from back pain, from migraine headaches, menstrual pain, tennis elbow, post-operative dental pain. All right, so sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Some people it works on and some people it doesn't work on. If you think it's going to help you, it's more likely to work. Why? Be well, potentially because of the placebo effect. <clears throat> it, nothing works on me, okay? I'm so cynical about just about everything, so nothing could possibly work on me. Uh, percutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, or PINS, is a relatively new form of acupuncture. Uh, PINS uses acupuncture-like needles to stimulate peripheral sensory, ner sensory nerves to assist in the management of pain. I got into bed last night, the dog was sleeping in, in bed, and I'd been scooting along the floor, so I had all the static electricity. <laughs> got into bed, and I could see the, the static electricity lighting up my dog. <laughs> it's like a halo. <laughs> uh, the funny thing was, she didn't even react to it. I figured she would have, you know, anyway, she didn't. If it had been my wife, she would have punched me right in the nose. <laughs> uh, with the dog, I guess. I don't know. Really kind of funny. It really it actually highlighted me. I wanted to go out and do it again, but I'm not sure that would have worked. Uh, PINS has been found effective in management of post-operative gynecological pain. Uh, migraine headaches, uh, headache pain, and leg and foot pain, pain from diabetes. Um, yeah, okay. <clears throat> Cedric the Entertainer has been doing a commercial uh, dealing with uh, uh, foot pain, the, the foot pain from diabetes. Evidently his father had it, according to the advertisement. Henry. Anyway, Cedric the Entertainer, being serious. 
He's supposed to be a comedian, and here he is being serious. Uh, excluding the 12-step programs, acupuncture is the most widely used CAM method for treatment of substance abuse. This is a first for me. I had never heard of that until I read this textbook. I would never heard about uh, people using acupuncture to, to cure uh, substance abuse. Uh, actually, I have. Uh, they, they can stick an a, uh, acupuncture needle in your earlobe, and theoretically it takes away the nicotine, nicotine cravings from tobacco. Now, the funny thing about tobacco is it only has about a 10% recovery rate. So about, uh, of all the people that try to stop smoking, only about 10% actually achieve it um, within a select amount of time. Uh, and you would think that if this really worked, this acupuncture stuff really worked, on, on the nicotine cravings that these individuals, uh, that, that everybody would be sticking pins in their earlobes or whatever. Uh, women have uh, pierced ears, and I don't see them, I see them smoking from time to time with pierced ears, right? <laughs> the goal of acupuncture treatment is reducing withdrawal symptoms, keeping abusers uh, in programs, and continuing abstinence from uh, drug use. This, there is mixed evidence where there is some promise in treating pain, addiction, and depression, but overall effectiveness is controversial as is just about everything that we're talking about in this chapter. Acupuncture is generally considered safe. Uh, serious adverse effects are very rare from acupuncture. I mean, what are you going to get, an infection? Acupuncture patients may abandon conventional therapy and not receive a needed bio, a biomedical diagnosis or intervention. And, of course, this is the problem. If you forego, like I said, the, the lady who... Uh, wants to have her give her son a, a lightning way uh, ceremony, which I have no problem. I mean, she can do whatever she wants to do, but if she stops giving that kid his thyroid medicine, now we got a really serious problem. That kid needs his thyroid medication. It's also really sad when you hear, like, you read stories about parents who have, like, treated their, their mm -hmm. child, like, for a strep throat. Right. And it turns out to be a Because yeah. they don't want to go to hospital. That is nuts. I had a professor, he was a chemistry professor when I was in college. Uh, he had uh, really serious leg problems. Uh, he was a church of, wait a minute, he was a Christian scientist. Christian scientists believe that you can pray away disease. Okay. And here this guy's a chemist. A very highly touted individual. Uh, and uh, so, he, so he gets this infection in his leg. And, the, and it's not going away. Of course it's not going away. He's not treating it. it he's going to church and they're praying that the, the, pain, the uh, infection will go away. And it, and it, ain't, and it ain't working. Uh, so finally his friend went over, uh, who's the biologist, and he looked at it and it was gangrene. Uh, yeah, gangrene it said. Now the problem with gangrene is that once it sets in, you either have, you have to remove it because it will make its way into your heart and it will kill you. Uh, and it kills you fairly quickly. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a slow process. Uh, so he had gangrene, and this guy said, well, uh, you won't go to the hospital to, to, uh, to have surgery done by doctors, um, and you want to pray this thing away, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and uh, amputate your leg with my pocket knife, because I, I am a doctor, but I'm you know, a PhD, I'm not an MD. So that shouldn't go against your religion. So he did. He started to cut on this guy's leg. He said, oh, stop it, stop it, stop it. I'll go to the hospital. So finally went to the hospital. He saved his life. Lost both legs. He lost both of his legs uh, because he didn't uh, seek treatment. Anyway, I guess that's a sad, sad story. Mm -hmm. so he lost both of his legs. But at least he stayed alive uh, for, an, for a while anyway. Yeah, so the sad thing is if they refuse treatment. Uh, there are cases where, I don't know, Quakers, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, uh, I'm not Church of Scientology, what am I thinking? Yeah, Church of Scientology does the same thing. Uh, Christian scientists, there are a lot of, um, uh, of denominations of Christianity that don't believe in, in uh, uh, treatment, in medical treatment, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> Church of the Nazarene, I don't know if you know anything about the Church of the Nazarene. 
Uh, and of course, this can be really serious. 35 states have established clinical uh, practice standards for acupuncturists. Uh, the number of acupuncturists per state uh, have to do with how dark it is. If it's white, uh, then there's between zero and ten, I think. Zero and a hundred. Okay. So the darker the state, the, uh, the more acupuncturists they have, which is kind of curious, isn't it? We've got four, the darkest states are Florida, Texas, Colorado, and, um, California, Illinois, and New York are the darkest ones. They've got the most, uh, the most uh, acupuncturists. Now, it really makes sense that California would have a lot of acupuncturists because they have a, a large Asian population. How about Texas? How many Asians do they have in Texas? I know. How about Florida? New York has a lot of Asians as well. How about Illinois? What in the world's going on? Colorado? There's a huge Asian population in Colorado? Well, I, now I know. I, I didn't see them when I was in Denver visiting my son. Uh, stages of hypnosis. Uh, the the pre-hypnotic stage is where the therapist engages in rapport building. Uh, the therapist will make suggestions and use imagery to induce relaxation and use focused attention to induce the hypnotic trance. Uh, I was in a classroom one time, uh, this was a behavior modification class, and uh, this guy used relaxation therapy and hypnosis. <coughs> he knocked us all out. Of course, we were all pretty damn tired. Uh, we'd all worked all... <laughs> this is when I was in the military. We'd worked all day. Uh, we were all pretty damn tired, so he just kind of put us all to sleep. Uh, but then he made hypnotic suggestions, and there were select individuals that actually responded to the hypnotic su suggestions. I was in the class, I didn't respond. I, I, was, I was asleep, I wasn't hypnotized, as funny as, or not funny as that is. During the treatment stage, the therapist will make suggestions and use imagery to reduce pain. Uh, they will use consolidation with post-hypnotic suggestions to be carried out after the hypnosis session has ended. During the post-hypnotic stage, the patient is alerted, uh, given additional instructions, uh, and uh, usually it's, it's a form of self-hypnosis, and these individuals are released after that. Uh, physiological hypnosis resembles other uh, forms of imagery and deep relaxation. Researchers see hypnosis as a form of social interaction rather than an altered state of consciousness. It is you interacting positively with the, <coughs> the hypnotist. We often allow ourselves to be trance-like, uh, to be put in uh, trance-like situations, such as when we are experiencing focused awareness, uh, when we are in a high-stress situation. Uh, suggestibility seems to be stronger in certain people, uh, people that are fantasy-prone, uh, people that are responsive to authority figures. And of course, I was in a classroom full of uh, officers, and uh, I was the only enlisted person, and uh, I was not hypnotized. <laughs> okay, So theoretically, I should have been the one that was the most responsive to authority figures, and I was the, actually the least, which makes a hell of a lot of sense to me, but they were all so confused as odd as that may seem. Anyway, people that are fantasy prone, people that uh, uh, um, day, uh, daydream a lot, uh, these individuals are more likely to, uh, uh, to be hypnotized. And of course, that it ain't me. I've never been hypnotized. They've tried to hypnotize me and it doesn't work. So possibly, uh, you're right, maybe I am an alien. All these things are wrong with me or right with me anyway. <clears throat> okay, so if we had uh, if we had Dr. Robinson in here, not Debbie Robinson, but Dr. Don Robinson, he uh, like I said, he went to a uh, I can't even remember the name of the place, Maharishi something or other in Iowa. Anyway, he practices transcendental meditation, and he claims that it works. Uh, he used to be my neighbor. We used to have these arguments all the time. Well, you can't really argue with somebody who practices transcendental meditation. You can't get them riled up. <laughs> uh, it's really hard to get them riled up. But anyway, it wasn't really an argument. It was more like a conversation. But he didn't convince me, and, and I certainly didn't change his mind. 
forms of progressive relaxation therapy, uh, mindfulness-based meditation, uh, non-judgmental in the uh, moment, stream of consciousness perceptions, uh, transcendental meditation is focused consciousness where the practitioner focuses on a single object or word called a mantra, and that's how they do it. That's how they put themselves into a trance-like state. Uh, this is what it looks like when they go into a trance. As you can see, the, uh, the uh, activity in the brain uh, is greatly reduced. Uh, so they're, they're focusing on one thing. Does it work? Yeah, it works for the people that do it. Uh, the people that can do that. <clears throat> but uh, the rest of us are going, are, are really, uh, uh, find it circumspect that this actually works. And actually, you can slow everything down. This is a picture of his university. They have a TM uh, room where people sit on pillows and, and meditate. Or not, I guess he's got a pillow, but she doesn't. Well, he's laying down, I'll take a nap too if I were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people swear with it, uh, by this stuff. Of course, I usually swear at it, but. What do they do? Oh, is it? Shelton. Shelton. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. That's too funny. Is he getting a telephone call? Is that what that yes. is? Yeah, okay. Uh, the body's metabolic rate uh, reflected in the amount of oxygen consumed decreased significantly in experienced meditators when they switched from simply resting to meditating. It uh, rose when they stopped meditating, of course. And, uh, you know, so for, like I said, for some people it works. And for other people, they really don't care. Relaxation treatments, a meta-analysis of 26 control trials involving uh, 1,264 hypertensive patients uh, showed that, uh, that CAM interventions based on relaxation training, meditation, and biofeedback were significantly more effective than no treatment in reducing their systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So we can actually lower blood pressure. Compared with credible placebo treatments, however, uh, CAM interventions were much less effective. The difference between the treatments was statistically and clinically insignificant. So the, the, uh, when they treated them with a placebo, uh, it worked just as well. As, uh, <laughs> it worked just as well. I apologize. It's not my fault. I didn't come up with that stuff. So don't tell Dr. Robinson. Relaxation treatment may alter a person's emotional response to pain and other symptoms. It teaches the sufferer to reinterpret the pain. Uh, as we were talking about last time about pain, you can uh, reroute this stuff. If you can block pain, the pain message from getting to your brain, the pain will go away. And that's, of course, what we, we are trying to do with relaxation therapy. We're trying to uh, get the individual to concentrate on blocking the pain. Uh, blocking the pain message from getting uh, to the brain. Uh, relaxation meditation may bolster the immune system. Relaxation training has been shown to increase natural killer cell uh, activity. And this is by a study from uh, Kai uh, Holt and Glasser et al. in 1985. And it also boosts the uh, serotonin level, so it makes you happier, this type of relaxation training. Biofeedback is a system of, that provides audible or visible feedback information regarding involuntary physiological states. Techniques, uh, you can use electromyography uh, uh, feedback or thermal biofeedback. This is obviously bio, uh, uh, thermal biofeedback uh, to tell you where your hot spots are. If you can figure out where your hot spots are, that is usually where your pain is. And of course, uh, when they start to get hot, uh, then, then you, uh, you start using your relaxation therapy to make the pain go away. Uh, effectiveness, uh, biofeedback is uh, beneficial in treatment of stress-related health problems. However, there are still too few well-controlled clinical outcome trials as there are mixed results from very few studies. Lurer and colleagues found that biofeedback can reduce autonomic arousal, anxiety, and stress-related disorders in some people, but it does not convey ad advantage over other behavioral techniques. Uh, the effect may be uh, a result of enhanced relaxation, 
placebo effect, passage of time, or suggestion. And sometimes we can suggest things to people and it will make the pain go away. You had a telephone call, I think. Or your telephone, your computer started making really funny noises. All right, okay. It was exciting. We, we all got excited. Sorry, We're gonna answer your, your computer. <laughs> Uh, chiropractic. Uh, this, this word drives me crazy. <clears throat> chiropractic looks like an adverb, an adjective. Chiropractic techniques, right? Mm -hmm. Looks like an adjective. It's a noun. <laughs> I don't know. It just drives me nuts. I'm an old English teacher. And chiropractic does not fit. I know, I wanted to argue about it. That's I looked weird. it up in Webster's. Because people also use it to address the person. Right. Chiropractic methods. I know. So it's an adjective and a noun. But chiropractic is it's a noun. <laughs> we can just talk about chiropractic. Mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't mean what a cold person who does that. Chiropractor. Okay. Uh, chiropractic, a complementary and alternative medicine approach to healing that is concerned with uh, the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disorders of the neuromuscular skeletal system. Uh, I used to uh, work with a DO. DOs are the osteopathic medicine. Uh, he was a DO and, and he knew all of the chiropractic techniques. I know now I'm using it as an adjective. Um, and he, uh, he worked with an old guy uh, who was a, an old DO uh, who was able to stop labor pain, labor with uh, with chiropractic techniques. I know, I was shocked. So if a lady came in with premature labor pains, uh, he was able to adjust her back and stop her, yeah, I know, it was really weird. Uh, so, the, and this guy wanted to learn, my, my DO wanted to learn from this other guy. Uh, so every time a lady would come in with premature labor pains, uh, he would call this guy up on the telephone, this old fart, I mean, this guy was older than dirt. And he would come in and he would adjust and you know, he can barely, he's in there adjusting it back. And then he's telling dirty stories, which not to the world, but he told them to me. I was thinking, oh man, you are, you're a pervert, you're an old man, what the hell's going on? Anyway, funny, funny stories. A uh, form of medical practice that provides all the benefits of conventional, the osteopathic medicine. Uh, it's a, form of medical uh, practice that provides all the benefits of conventional allopathic medicine. That's uh, what an MD does, uh, including prescriptions, drugs, and surgery, and emphasizes the structure and the function of the human body. It's a more holistic approach to medicine. Uh, these individuals also are uh, able to adjust uh, uh, backs. They're able to adjust uh, an individual. I, uh, I had, like I said, I worked for a DO. The guy must have weighed 300 pounds. So when he adjusted your back, wow, he adjusted your back. Uh, threw his back out one time on this little skinny lady that he couldn't get her back adjusted. I know. He was twisting, you know, you, 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 you pull up their legs and, and push on this part of them and, and it adjusts their back. And he was doing that and evidently she was fighting him or something. Anyway, he, he so he's back out. So, <laughs> so he called me in there and he's trying to get me to adjust his back. Of course, he's got a leg the size of my body. You know, this guy's got, he's huge. And here I am grabbing this, hold of this thing, and I'm trying to push on it. I only weigh like 150 pounds. I'm trying to adjust this guy's back. It didn't work. He got mad at me since I couldn't adjust his back. He called me all kinds of names. Wimp was the one that is probably the only nice word that I can use that he called me. Anyway, nice guy, he was a good guy. He's a, he's a really a good diagnostician. Um, straight uh, chiropractors are traditional traditionalists who continue to believe that misalignments cause pain and manipulation is best uh, form of treatment uh, for a wide range of ailments from asthma to lower back pain to impotence. Uh, and so theoretically they can adjust a male's back who is having problems with, uh, uh, with erectile dysfunction and they can cure it, according to some people. 
Mixers uh, combine traditional manipulations along with a, a broad range of other CAM therapies, including massage, physical therapy, and nutritional therapy. A limited range of conditions, especially acute uh, low back pain, headaches, and neck pain. Uh, I had a massage therapist one time that uh, I, uh, people have tried to massage, massage me and uh, I don't know, I guess you're supposed to relax or something. Something good is supposed to happen, but nothing good has ever happened when, when somebody tried to give me a massage. So this lady goes, well, I've never failed. You know, I don't know what that means. But anyway, so she starts, she starts, it was my, my wife's cousin. Uh, and so she starts rubbing on my back and, you know, and hitting, hitting me with, my, with her elbow and my back. And of course she says, well, what she said was, uh, you're so relaxed. I don't think in any massage is going to work on you. Because, you know, I'm just not a tense person. I just don't take things seriously. I guess that's my problem. So massage, I don't need a massage. But she said I didn't need one, so I was okay. okay. I don't know what would have happened next. Limited range of conditions, especially acute back. Oh, wait a minute, what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, we're talking about massage therapy. Uh, nutritional therapy and physical therapy. Limited range of conditions, especially acute low back pain, headaches, and neck pain. Uh, my wife, of course, is going to have her surgery. Uh, she'll have to go to a physical therapist to get her leg back uh, after she has the, um, they put the Teflon, I guess it's a Teflon ball in a titanium socket or something. We'll see what happens. Chiropractic work uh, enjoys enormous popularity, especially for back pain. In, uh, before 1974, and of course I was working in medicine before 1974, uh, you couldn't get anybody to pay for chiropractic, uh, for a chiropractic work. But in 1974, Congress permitted Medicare payments for chiropractic work. Uh, it is licensed in all 50 states. Uh, critics charge that chiropractic is useless because misaligned vertebra are very common. Uh, if we went around the room and looked at everybody's vertebra, we would probably find that half of us had uh, misaligned uh, vertebra. Uh, it's very common. It doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't hurt anything. Uh, it usually uh, clears up on its own. Uh, I was at the gym yesterday. Oh, I did dips. Uh, every time I do dips, my, my, uh, my spinal column uh, will pop. I'm doing something, I don't know, strength, lengthening my spine or something. Anyway, it will pop. And, and it's, what it's doing is popping back into alignment. And I'm just kind of resting up there and, and doing dips and, I, uh, and uh, my, my, uh, <coughs> my vertebrae are going back into place, I guess. Uh, however, retrospective and prospective evidence supports uh, efficacy of uh, chiropractic in treating low back pain so we know it does work on low back pain. Nature, natural, naturopathic medicine is a system that uh, aims to provide holistic health care by drawing from several traditional healing systems, including homeopathy, herbal uh, remedies, and traditional Chinese medicines. I've been reading a, a Chinese novel. It's just fascinating because they keep treating these people with like the bark off of this tree and this, this plant root and rat feces. That was the weird one for me. I know. Uh, evidently over the weekend, uh, the, the mice had a party on my desk. Uh, <laughs> just in one corner. Or either that or it was the toilet. I, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure. Anyway, there was a lot of mouse droppings over on the one corner of my desk. So. I know, I just read that book about you know, using rat feces <laughs> to treat uh, menstrual pains. <laughs> uh, luckily, I have no pain, so I didn't like scoop them up. And, anyway, I, I knocked them off my head. Our herbal medicine is derived from leaves, stems, roots, bark, flowers, fruits, seeds, and sap of plants. Herbs, also called botanicals, can be prepared or marketed in different forms. If you ever go to a Chinese market, you'll find these things. Uh, it's really kind of fascinating. Uh, of course, we've got uh, Westerners that are going, oh, you know, they're looking for the magic elixir of, what, of, of life or whatever. So they go to these things and they, they're looking for something. 
Uh, herbal medicine uh, uh, plays a central role in Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic uh, medicine, and Native American medicine. It takes several forms, tonics, tinctures, uh, decoctions, and effectors. Uh, tinctures, of course, are something mixed with alcohol. Uh, physicians believe that herbal medicine is ineffective. <laughs> Animal and human trials have shown that it is effective in treating arthritis, osteoarthritis, and burns. Though there has been some mixed results as far as that goes as well. Nutritional medicine. Uh, wait a minute. Two fifty. Okay. Uh, nutritional medicine can be used to correct dietary deficiencies. Megadose therapy can be used to trigger specific therapeutic effects. Uh, who was the guy that uh, he was dying of uh, pancreatic cancer? Uh, Michael Landon was dying of pancreatic cancer, so he decided that he would try megadoses of vitamins to cure himself. He's dead a couple weeks anyway, but you know, well, why, why the hell not? I mean, it's just <laughs> so he tried these megadoses. And maybe it kept him alive for a couple more weeks. Who knows? You never know. <clears throat> anyway, he's dead. Uh, Linus Pauling claimed that uh, taking mega doses of vitamin C uh, 10 to 15 times the, uh, the recommended uh, daily allowance would control stress. I don't know if you've ever tried that. Uh, I'd probably take uh, mega doses of vitamin C with my uh, lemonade. I, each, each can of lemonade, uh, each of these containers has a half a lemon in it. And I'll drink two or three of these a day. What do you think? Maybe doses of vitamin C? Is that why I'm so happy all the time? I don't know. It could be. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, dietary medicine. I know. Nothing gets too good. <laughs> it bugs the hell out of Sarah. She'll get all excited about something. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, dietary medicine. Uh, Correcting uh, food allergy sensitivities by staying away from trigger foods, uh, sugar, wheat, and dairy. Usually if somebody has a, uh, a food allergy, it's to either sugar, wheat, or dairy. Gluten usually, as far as the wheat is concerned. Uh, raw food theory, macrobiotics, purports that raw foods are unhealthy, and even vegetables should only be consumed after cooks. Of course, some people love their raw vegetables. Substantial evidence that, oh, I had uh, strawberries for lunch. I guess it's the uh, uh, strawberries are, are more likely to be contaminated than any other fruit. If you don't wash them, I don't care. I'm reading about people eating rat feces, so <laughs> I don't care about a little salmonella in my strawberries. Substantial evidence that dietary foods or supplements can have a major effect on risk factors for certain diseases, high fiber, low fat, Vegetarian increasingly accepted uh, treatments for managing cardiovascular disease by lowering the blood glucose levels in diabetics and reducing insulin needs. Theoretically, if you become a vegetarian, uh, then all of these things will take place naturally. Uh, some unregulated dietary supplements may contain hazardous substances. Uh, mm -hmm. FDA warns against use of certain herb supplements by those taking prescription medications. Uh, it was last winter that they came out uh, against GNC. Uh, the state of New York sued GNC because there was no uh, ginkgo in their ginkgo below the tablets. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh man, guess what? I, I, I take ginkgo biloba from GNC. <laughs> I don't care. <clears throat> it doesn't matter to me. Uh, diseases that are strongly affected by lifestyle and environment are, are, are among those uh, for which nat naturopathic uh, treatment is most often reported to be effective. Allergies, fatigue, uh, arthritis, asthma, headache, hypertension. Critics claim that unsuspecting consumers are flooded with unsupported claims and that herbs are not tested according to pharmaceuticals. Standards. I'm not sure there are any pharmaceutical standards. What do I take? I take uh, ginkgo and ginseng. What else do I take? Oh, L-carnitine. It's supposed to increase the uh, the uh, uh, circulation in your brain. I don't know if it works, but I'm afraid not to take it. My sister's starting to suffer from dementia because she's an idiot. 
Uh, I can say that about my own sister, right? Uh, she's theoretically she has this really high IQ, but she's never used her brain for anything. She, I don't know, she, what do they call that? Knit, not knits. What's the other one? Crochets. crochets. She crochets. What's that all about? She has the worst taste in the world. Oh my God. Anyway, she's starting to suffer from dementia. I told her to use l carnitine. We'll see what happens next. Okay. Uh, with the ACA, there has been a, with the Affordable Care Act, uh, there has been a major paradigm shift in medicine and healthcare in the United States. With quality information on the internet, passive dependent patients have turned into activist health consumers. Uh, the traditional conventional medicine has had at least has to at least acknowledge the complementary relationship with, uh, with CAMS. Uh, the passage of medical marijuana laws in many states has altered providers, alerted providers to the fact that tens of thousands of people are seeking alternative means of dealing with their problems. And of course, we can take that one to the bank. Uh, little, 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 uh, the best of both worlds. In the end, no single approach to healthcare has all the answers. The search for the best solution to, the med to a medical condition often requires a willingness to look beyond one remedy or system of treatment. And of course, that is one of the reasons why we talk about CAMS. We are done. Uh, that is the end of chapter 15. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the chapter. <laughs> I did.